Talking about uh, establishing a baseline uh, for this project, um, basically uh, what we were interested in doing was finding a pr uh, prediction model that was computationally inexpensive, it was easy to implement, and ultimately uh, something that was accurate. Um, and our application obviously uh, is to try to gauge how well we're doing um, with our strategies and also um, the hope was that we could possibly implement this in a controller um, that we can actually have live feedback with how well we're doing, with how well we, or I guess what we've expected the building to be able to do. So um, I'm probably not going to go over this since you guys have been drilled over the head, but uh, basically our, our application is, is demand response. And uh, what, we're, what we're interested in is, is trying to figure out in this demand response period, uh, how much load we're actually shedding and trying to get an actual adjusted estimate instead of just trying to figure out and pick off, oh, we had a drop of 20 kilowatts or 30 kilowatts. This is, this is a way of, of actually matching up that baseline. Um, okay, so Satarja Dai Hall, obviously the hall we're standing in. Um, well, a uh, little, little thing about this is uh, there's two two 600 ton chillers that we're actually working with, which makes, uh, it makes for basically an interesting situation where a building can actually be treated uh, similar to two buildings because of uh, half the year basically we have an absorption chiller that's running and then the other half we have the centrifugal chiller, which adds an entire different load um, to the building because you have to have all that, that compressor in there. So it shifts, it shifts our baseline um, basically about 200 to 300 kilowatts, um, which is which is something that's interesting to account for. Um, initially, um, when when we started building the baseline, um, basically we we had some interesting issues with the centrifugal chiller that caused um, that where the centrifugal chiller was was short cycling uh, pretty frequently, almost uh, multiple times in a day, and we were we were having a lot of issues. Um, with developing a baseline that could actually capture that kind of behavior. Um, and so the, in, the initial thought was to go with something kind of simple and, and try to build correction factors. You know, we didn't want anything that was really computationally expensive. And um, we, we, running through some of this uh, building correction factors and, and putting some simple model together, we realized that with, if you just picked off a time period of, of 15 minutes, you would have a huge jump, and, and what was happening is you were seeing large errors with a simple model, um, and, and the thought was we should probably go with something that might be able to um, capture some of these rules, some of these uh, nonlinearities. Um, so we kind of went with something that was a little bit more, um, a little more heavy duty, and, and caused for some uh, robustness in terms of, of predicting something that, that we could actually feel proud of. Um, so there, there's current methods for load prediction that we see often is uh, seasonal regression or temperature regression, basically looking at different parameters and, and uh, trying to fit data. Uh, a lot of times you see piecewise uh, kind of regression models, which is uh, something similar to kind of this. This is a, a linear temperature regression, uh, just trying to make relationships. You see artificial neural networks, uh, which is a little more complex. You have a hidden layer. Um, and, you know, there's a lot that goes behind this. And then uh, there's Fourier transform models. Um, and each of these have been seen. Uh, regression models, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs has done. Artificial neural networks have been used uh, extensively in uh, market, uh, power markets and that kind of stuff. And then uh, Texas A&M had this Fourier transform model that they developed. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how can we gauge, you know, if we're actually doing something right, you know, what, what is a good level of accuracy to shoot for? And so, so we had to select a model to, uh, to kind of choose from. Um, we, uh, selecting these models was kind of tricky because a lot of these models required extra software, extra costs that we didn't really want to spend that kind of money or that time, really. Um, so we chose uh, LBNL's BP3 method as a, as a comparison. Um, you know, it was minimal comp computation time. It's basically a correction factor, which was something that we were kind of looking for. Uh, access to personnel. I mean, it's it's uh, we were working with LBNL on this project, which was really good, um, and also that uh, it's just simple to model and it's cheap. And yep, it's a hop, skip, and a jump away, which is pretty nice. <laughs> uh, so. Basically, uh, LBNL uh, 
in Marianne, Piet, and uh, Scylla, and they've, they've worked on a lot of different development of models. Uh, they actually have a paper out that I think there's nine or ten models that have been developed. And they, they go through calculating the, the error and also the bias and, and these kind of things. So um, I felt like keeping with, with that kind of strategy in terms of figuring out how and assessing our model, we'd kind of use that same format. Um, the, let me talk a little bit about the BP3 method is they basically select the three highest temperature days of the previous 10 and calculate a simple average of power for each hour and then uh, they have a morning correction factor which uh, uses basically the uh, demand at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. of that morning uh, and then divides it by or adds those together and then divides by the average uh, for the 10 and 11 for those three. Uh, highest temperature days. Um, it's basically, it's a simple modification of this standard model that's been used, and, um, but it adds this correction factor, which makes it uh, better. Um, I'll talk a little bit now about what, what uh, the method that we chose, uh, that we did was, um, it's basically uses fuzzy logic. Um, what f uh, I'll talk a little bit about what fuzzy logic is, but we, we took in various inputs in the form of real time, uh, morning of and also previous 10-day data um, to build a set of membership rules. Um, so what it basically does is we, we have this uh, Gaussian distribution uh, and what happens is we, we use uh, membership functions to generate all these rules and then we put on a recursive least squares um, method on top of it to improve the, the calculation power of it. And then we come up with basically a single delta output, which is what's seen on the far right. Um, I'm not going to, uh, so I'm, now I'm going to talk about what fuzzy logic is. Um, basically, uh, fuzzy set theory was actually introduced by one of Cal, uh, Berkeley's own uh, Professor Zadeh of the computer science and mathematics. He's uh, uh, he was basically the mastermind behind this, and it, it transformed the way we think about probability theory. We, we always had this idea that it was based on this classical binary uh, logic, and, and it, it transformed it to be a continuous value of logic, um, and we, we actually can think of things in that way. So uh, the way to think about it, uh, if you want to conceptualize it, is that it's just like an, apple, uh, like an algebraic function which maps a variable to an out, uh, input variable to an output variable. A fuzzy system can actually map an input group of variables and actually map it to a single output value or to a, a group of output variables if you want. Uh, groups of output variables are, are a little more obviously complex in terms of uh, computational time and it adds a lot. Uh, but if you wanted to uh, pull in an input group and pull out single output value, you get really quick computational time um, Literally, it, it would probably run within five, ten seconds, which was really awesome. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about the theory. I don't want to go too deep into a lot of the math, so I, I left a lot of that stuff out. <laughs> but um, but uh, what it basically did is uh, we had to build a set of training data, obviously. Um, so over the, over the past six months, we, we gathered data from non-holiday weekdays, and uh, we used those to train the algorithm. Um, Unfortunately, we, you know, we had a lot of, a lot, like I said, we had the chiller issues that finally got fixed. So we had a, a very limited set of data to build this training data. And, and we had a lot of data from the absorption chiller. So um, the absorption chiller was basically where, we, where we, used, we used the absorption chiller system to determine, to test this method out and see how well we would do. Um, so we ran it for each individual time step. So in our case, we did 30, 30 minute time steps uh, for an entire day from, uh, I guess, 12 o'clock to 5.30. And we basically did a testing for every half hour. Uh, we can obviously, uh, we can change this to five minute intervals if we wanted to, as long as we have the data to do it, um, or 15 minute intervals. Generally, we feel like a lot of the systems in the building, uh, you know, have settling times that are greater than five minutes and you know so I mean 15 minute intervals you know for in terms of uh, thermal systems and that kind of stuff is probably is a pretty good target and it and it's not that hard like I said the computational time is very minimal in this kind of thing um, so I'll talk a little about the inputs that we put in uh, similarly to the L, uh, BLP3 method that LBNL used we did the three hottest days of the previous 10 uh, 
for, and we, we entered that as a, a, uh, an input. We also had uh, two inputs from the morning of, similarly to this correction factor kind of thing. And we used some real-time weather data, which was relative humidity uh, and outside air temperature at each step. Uh, and then we basically have an output of this power. Um, if we wanted to, we could actually use a uh, weather forecast for humidity and outside air temperature looking ahead and, and trying to do that. Of course, that adds some more uncertainty to this calculation, which, you know, is a trade-off, but, but we could actually look forward and, and possibly plan in this kind of controller scheme of things. Um, so what we do is we take these five inputs and then we basically, uh, we build these membership functions in the form of a Gaussian. Uh, you can use any type of membership function. Gaussian functions are pretty common, so we, we decided to go ahead and do that. Um, and what the basic thought of process is, is we basically start with one rule and we try to, we set a user tolerance, which is this epsilon F thing. Um, and what happens is we, we basically build this, uh, we have a stopping condition where we set that as the tolerance and we pull the first set of data, which is the first actual uh, output, which is this y sub i. And then we, we calculate this uh, f. And then if it's greater than that, we base, what happens is we step forward and we build another rule. So, it's, so like I said, this is, <laughs> it's pretty math intensive. I don't want to get into it too much because it's kind of boring. But um, we basically, in, we have the process of adding an additional rule if, if this criteria is not met, and then it just continues to repeat um, until, until you have basically this condition that's met. Um, and then at the end, we add a recursive least squares improvement, which is a lot more math. <laughs> um, so the testing of these methods, we basically used uh, five test days um, to uh, test in January and February, and uh, we chose, uh, we basically pulled these data, the, the three highest temperature days for the previous 10 for each of these days for, L, for the LP3 method. Uh, for our method, we basically used a training set of data. Uh, we made sure that these, these training sets didn't, weren't on the exact same days. Obviously, we didn't want to use our own data, you know, that we're testing for that kind of stuff. So we made sure that that kind of stuff was, you know, um, and then what we did was we used SMAP, as uh, Dave Kohler uh, was talking about earlier, to pull a lot of this stuff from uh, this, uh, this uh, website or server that we have basically going. Um, what we did was we calculated this RS, RLS error and also the bias and then compared it for each time step in each, in each test day. So here are actually some of the results. Um, uh, as you can see, it's, it's kind of a little hard to see, but this is for each of the five days. Um, you can see that we did pretty well in some, in some cases, and then in other cases we didn't do so well. As in, so you can see uh, day three we did, we did better than the BLP3 and also day two, but then it seemed like in the later hours of the day we didn't do so well. What that could be is, is uh, basically some additional uncertainty in terms of occupancy. We don't really have those kind of, that kind of data, at least at the moment. Um, and, and what that can do is that can change a lot of the membership rules that we just built because the whole system changes. Um, and, and we had a lot of, uh, we had a, a decent amount of success with actually coming pretty close uh, to, so I'll actually look at, show you the RMS error. Um, so for each time step, we actually did better um, than this method um, for one through three, actually through 3.30 and then Four o'clock and five o'clock, we didn't do so well. Um, well, as well, and uh, these are actually the the errors in, listed in this table. Um, uh, I also measured the bias for each of these test days, um, and you can see we were a little bit. Uh, our bias was a little shifted towards uh, we were under, I guess, what what the actual was. But you can see this is uh, like the max we were under was about two point oh two something around there percent, which is pretty good. Um, and we, which was, uh, we were pretty happy with. It just means that with our model where we would actually not, we would actually probably be doing better than we actually say we're doing because we're actually predicting that we'd be using less without any, any strategy implemented. So, you know. Um, talk a little bit about uncertainty and variability 
predictability and this prediction process. Um, obviously, with any type of prediction, you have errors that uh, come from parameter uncertainty, from structural uncertainty, and also just natural variability of the system. Um, and uh, it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a tricky process. It it definitely is. Um, parameter uncertainty is uh, something that we have some power of of calculating uncertainty pretty easily. Um, uh, structural uncertainty is a little bit tougher because you have to analyze all the different ways that you can you can calculate this, different methods that you can use to get to this certain point. And then variability is obviously really really tricky, um, especially with you know these physical systems. Um, so uh, uncertainty can also be misleading um, because a lot of times you have parameters, two parameters that you might use are actually often correlated, which causes this underestimation of uncertainty. Uh, sometimes they're auto-correlated. Um, you know, certain, certain models are, so certain uh, tests are using same, the same data that you use to build. Um, and then uh, this heteroscedastic, which basically the system can change from from hour to hour, uh, you know, or day to day kind of thing. Um, so it can be complex and also large numbers of inputs can complicate the calculation. Um, so in our application, um, basically I, I looked at uh, trying, to, trying to calculate this uncertainty. Um, unf unfortunately, so the parameter uncertainty that, that we talk about, um, a lot of times in prediction, it's, it's estimated to be pretty high because you're trying to forecast ahead in our case, we were using actual data, so the only kind of parameter uncertainty that we had was obviously in the measurement and that kind of stuff, calibration. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of assumed that that to be pretty minimal. The biggest, the biggest one for us would actually be just this assessment of model uncertainty. And um, like I said, this is a very, very complex thing to calculate. On, yeah, okay. And, um, and so, yeah, these, these are, that's basically stepping forward is this left picture, and then the right we have was kind of more what we would be doing. Um, conclusions. Uh, basically, um, we found that it was a pretty reasonable, reasonably accurate model for load prediction um, in terms of error and bias. Um, early afternoon predictions, uh, we saw a pretty good uh, improvement, but later on we kind of fell short a little bit. Um, but with uh, new innovations in building occupancy, like uh, some people that we've been working with have been working on using wireless sensor networks to try to gauge occupancy, also using uh, traffic, uh, network traffic, these kind of methods, we can actually probably improve on this. Of course, with these kind of measurements and, and estimation, we also add uncertainty, um, which is obviously a trade-off that you kind of, you know, with, with more measurements, we also have this kind of uncertainty issue. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, any questions? Great. Thank you very much, Tyler.